Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this first in a new series of webinars we're running employing the theory of marginal gains and its application to IVF. Speaking in the webinar today we're delighted to have Dr Dave Morrill join us. Dave has worked as a clinical embryologist since 1986, training in Manchester, where he also completed his PhD studies. He has managed several laboratories in the UK, including being responsible for the designs of labs in Leeds and Daresbury. He joined Origio as Director of Embryology in November 2011, becoming Director of Clinical Support for Cooper Surgical in January 2019. Dave previously served as Chair of the UK Association of Clinical Embryologists, ACE, and Association of Biomedical Andrologists, ABA, as well as being involved with several working groups, notably the HFEA Expert Group on Multiple Births after IVF. He is currently a Technical Assessor for ISO 15189 for UCAS. In his current role, Dave is part of the Medical Affairs team, team providing technical and scientific support as well as, as well as education and training. He has specific responsibility for lab designs, clinical trials and lab audits. We're also very pleased today to have Dr. Steve Troop join us. Steve has worked in the field of human clinical embryology for nearly 35 years, starting in Manchester, where he completed a PhD in male infertility and the acrosome reaction. Before his recent role as the scientific director of EV UK, Steve was the scientific director of Liverpool Women's Hospital Hewitt Fertility Centres, one of the UK's largest providers of assisted conception. In addition to dealing with the many day-to-day hands-on managerial and research responsibilities of a consultant clinical embryologist, he's also gained a broader perspective as a scientific inspector and advisor for the UK regulator, the HFEA. Steve has been very much involved in clinical embryology and as a profession is proud to have been both chair and president of the UK's Association of Clinical Embryologists or ACE and a founder member of the newly formed Association of Reproductive and Clinical Scientists, ARCS. Steve is a visiting reader in reproductive medicine at Edgehill University and is an honorary senior fellow at the University of Liverpool. He supervised the development of the equine ICSI lab at the university's Leehurst campus. Steve now works independently as a consultant reproductive scientist based in the UK. If you have any questions today, please do enter them into the Q&A box. We're just a 30 minute webinar today, but in any time that we do have left at the end, we will address any questions to Steve and Dave. Thank you very much. I will now hand over to you, Steve. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, I'm just trying to get my video on. Hello, everybody. Um, well, thank you very much indeed for the, the kind of introduction uh, and, and the invitation to take part in this webinar series discussing the, the notion of, uh, of applying a marginal gains approach to the IVF lab. Um, I guess as well as introducing the subject today, um, I, 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 I want to try and present a rationale for using the marginal gains approach in, in, in the IVF lab. Um, and this is something that's interested me certainly for the last 10 years or so. So let's start by taking a quick look at the results of the survey, uh, which I think you've got on your screens now. And uh, thanks for those of you that have, have responded. Um, so this was always going to be a slightly risky, <laughs> risky slide for me because I didn't know what was going to come up. But um, it's interesting that out of all the people that have responded there, only one person has um, stated that they think they've got little room for improvement um, in, in the outcomes from their, uh, that from their pregnancy rates, um, which I guess is probably what I expected to see. Um, and you can see that the majority of people there think that their outcomes are, are around about average. So maybe that suggests that there is, people do think there's room for improvement. So leading on from the um, leading on from the survey, I'd, I'd like to first try and answer the question: um, <clears throat> Do UK centres get different outcomes? And to do this, um, I've used data that's available uh, on the HFEA's website. Um, and many of you will know that within the choose a fertility section the view detailed statistics um, button there uh, 
allows you to filter and extract raw data um, relating to uh, the clinic's performance. Um, I think we need to recognize that there are some pros and cons associated with, um, uh, with using these data from, from the HFEA's website in this way. Um, the pros are that firstly, in the UK, we have to submit data to the HFEA. This submission is mandatory. Um, submission is electronic, so there shouldn't be any kind of typographical errors in there. Um, the data are validated, um, so there should be uh, robustness around the data. And the way in which the data are presented for each clinic um, is, is the same. So there is a, a consistent analysis approach. So I think it's reasonable to compare like with like um, in, in the way that I've, I'll show you in a minute. Um, the downsides, I guess, is that there is a time lag with the HFEA data. Understandably, it takes, um, it takes a huge amount of time to, uh, for, the, for, the, for the HFEA to collate their data. Um, and also, um, what, uh, we only have what we can see. So the, 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 the data are limited. Um, on a personal note, um, it's extremely laborious to get this information out of the website because there isn't a way of, of looking at the entire data set, unfortunately, um, as it stands at the moment. So it's taken quite some time to get this information out. And um, finally, what, what I would like to say uh, and, and to stress really is that um, the data that I'm going to present do not constitute any type of prospective randomised control trial. Um, and really should only be taken at face value. But um, nevertheless, I hope you'll, uh, you'll find them interesting. Um, these are the query filters that I've used um, with, with the same filters being used for ev every center. So I've looked at two time periods, the, the three year period from um, January 15 to the end of 2017, and then um, uh, the latest uh, data period that's available from January to December 2018. I've looked at patients uh, who were treated using straightforward IVF or ICSI. So um, in, the, in the data, there are, uh, there's no donor eggs, there's no PGTA. Um, and I've only looked at patients under the age of 35 years old. The outcome measure that I've used is pregnancies and births per embryo transfer to try and um, deal with differences in, in the elective single embryo transfer strategies. And um, I should also point out as well that the center ID numbers that you'll see um, on, the, on the following graphs are not the HFEA center number, nor do they track through the, through the slides. So there's no point trying to pick out your own center from these data. Um, you won't be able to do it. And that, that's, that was deliberate on my part. So um, here are the outcomes for fresh cycles for the 77 centres that submitted data over that time period over the three years from 2015 to 2017. And you'll notice quite a range from 47% centre one um, down to 17% for centre 77. Um, and this is in patients that are all the same age, having the same type of treatment as, as I've mentioned. Um, but as the HFEA point out, only one center, center 15, is statistically higher than the national average of, of 34%. And only one center, center uh, 74, is statistically lower. The remaining 75 centers are, according to the HFEA, consistent with the national average. And whilst I wouldn't pretend for one minute to understand the stats behind how they've, um, how they've reached these conclusions, I have no doubt that they are, they are indeed correct. And um, here are the same data for frozen cycles with what appears to be a similar um, or, or maybe even wider range of outcomes with again, only two centers statistically above and, and one center statistically below the national average. So um, what kind of things might have an effect on these outcomes? Firstly, let, let's take a look at the size of the center. 
this slide correlates the, 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 the center size in terms of the number of cycles started um, over this three year period uh, against outcome. And um, you can see that effectively these data suggest that there's no effect of the size of the center with both large and small centers both getting higher and lower outcomes. So it doesn't appear that center size makes a difference. Interestingly, this graph shows that there's quite a good correlation between outcomes for fresh cycles and outcomes for frozen cycles. In other words, centers that have a higher fresh outcome seem to have a higher frozen outcome too. And I mean, dare I suggest maybe the centers with higher outcomes are, are genuinely generating better embryos, who knows? It's also interesting I think that those centres that did well in 2015 to 2017, in that three year period, continued to do well in 2018, as you can see here. So there's, there's a good correlation between those two time periods. So again, are, are, are some centres genuinely doing things better than others? So Taking another look at the, the slide I showed you before, you recall that according to the HFEA, there are only two, uh, all but two of, of the centres here are consistent with the national average. But what happens if we compare centres with each other? And we can do this, uh, as many of you will know, again, by using the raw data from the HFEA's website. Um, I must point out at this stage, I'm not a I'm not a statistician, but I have, um, I have taken uh, advice from a medical statistician to ensure that what I've done um, is statistically reasonable here. Um, so as an example, um, taking centers nine and, and 67 as an example, uh, as reasonably large centers, so center nine did just over a thousand cycles, in this three years and, and sent to 67, 638. Um, and, but there are, are there either ends of the graph. And a, a simple chi-square analysis on these um, pregnancies per embryo transfer rates um, suggest a highly significant difference in the outcome between these two centers. And there are of course many, um, many other comparisons that, that I could have made that would probably illustrate similar differences. So I think these data suggest that centres do indeed generate different outcomes. And, and this leads me into the concept of, uh, of why they might be doing that and, and, and the, the notion of marginal gains as a way of optimising outcomes. The, the whole notion of marginal gains was brought to light by this chap, Sir David Brailsford, um, who was appointed uh, as the um, performance coach. Thank you, pardon, I've just lost my mouse. There we are. Uh, who was um, appointed as the performance coach for the British cycling team um, around, I guess, 10 years ago or so. Uh, a little bit more. And um, he has stated that, uh, as you can see on the slide, the whole principle came from the idea that if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and improved each of those individual components by 1%, you get a significant increase when you put them all together. And as scientists, this probably makes more sense um, graphically, really. And it probably looks a bit like this, where the little bits don't make a difference, but when you start to add them all together, you do indeed see a difference. So what did Dave Brailsford actually do? Um, in essence, he, he looked at um, every single thing that went into uh, running, uh, riding and, and um, competing on a bike. And some of the improvements he made are, are fairly obvious, like redesigning the saddle, uh, or the clothing, or taking biometric uh, uh, readings from the riders. Um, but others were less obvious, um, like, for example, uh, 
taking their own personalised pillow and bed to all of the competitions and painting the inside of the team truck uh, white so that the technicians, the cycling technicians, could spot dust that might damage these incredibly expensive and, and highly tuned bikes. And um, uh, remarkably, he also uh, provided the riders with education around hand washing to minimise the spread of colds. Who'd have known, eh? And it is, um, it's widely recognised now that, that this approach significantly contributed to what was an unprecedented success of the British cycling team um, over the following years, some of which are listed on the slide here. So why do we see these differences in outcomes in, in IVF centres then? Let's have a think about that. Well, I think um, there, are, um, there are some obvious factors which, which we know about already. For example, it's widely accepted that um, race and ethnicity can affect IVF outcome. And here's a couple of, of good examples from literature, literature um, fairly recent literature describing this. And um, socioeconomic factors can have an effect. This is a really interesting paper um, from the, uh, published last year from the Leeds group where outcomes were analyzed, treatment outcomes were analyzed according to the patient's postcode um, and the data suggested that those patients that lived in more deprived um, areas didn't do as well as those patients that lived in the more um, affluent areas of, uh, of Leeds, I guess. And um, I'm sure many of you will be sitting there thinking that uh, our clinical colleagues have an effect. Um, for example, with, with, the, with the many different superovulation regimens that are out there. Um, used in our centres. And again, we can see this if we look at the same um, uh, HFEA data set that uh, I, I used before. And we can see this reveals quite a large difference in the cycle cancellation rate. Um, these are cycles cancelled before egg collection, uh, with some centres cancelling no cycles at all, down on the left hand side of the graph, um, through to some centres cancelling over 10% of their cycles even in these younger patients uh, who are under 35 years old. But the focus of this series of webinars is the laboratory. And um, there, there is a huge amount to think about, I think. Um, and, and that's perhaps described well here in this article by Don Riga, um, who, uh, where he suggested that there might be some 175 different lab factors that could influence outcome. And you can see the, the different areas where these might apply on the slide. The difficulty that we have, of course, is that there are, um, there are certainly many factors that influence outcome, and we've, we've touched briefly on, on a few of them. But it's extremely difficult to work out the contribution of each. And what we would like to do, as I've mentioned already, is to concentrate in this series of webinars um, on, on the influence of the, of the laboratory of the IVF lab and how we might improve little by little the contribution of the lab to the overall outcome. So this uh, slide shows uh, the topics which we thought we'd explore in these webinars over the next few months. Um, but please feel free to make suggestions if there are any areas in which you think marginal gains might be made um, and, and areas that you think we should be discussing. Um, that this, this set of titles is, is by no means a, a tablet of stone. So um, finally, before handing over to Dave, um, I'd like to leave you with a, with a couple of thoughts. When I started my career in, in 1985, I spent most of my time trying to get the basics right, thinking about temperature, different incubators, pH, media composition that we were making ourselves. So it was all about getting the basics right. Um, but the world of the embryologist has changed hugely since then, um, as, as you'll all know. Uh, and it's changed for the better, I hasten to add, for, for the large part. Um, 
And we now have all these additional things to fill our minds on a daily basis, morphokinetics, PGTA, quality management, witnessing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, things which just didn't exist uh, back when I started. And I wonder if it is fair to suggest that we now assume that the basics are right. Um, and I don't know, maybe, maybe they're not. And that's what this, um, what this series of webinars is all about. So I'd like to leave you with this comment, which Dave Brailsford was um, heard to apparently frequently utter to his, uh, to his cyclists. Um, do the simple things extremely well. And I'd like to hand over now to, um, to Dave Morrill for, um, well, for some proper science and uh, for some practical advice looking into how we can uh, apply a marginal gains approach um, to the egg collection process. Thank you very much indeed for your, uh, for your attention. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve, uh, for that um, thorough, and I know how much work went into that thorough and uh, intriguing review of the HFEA results, but also um, setting the scene for uh, the relevance of the marginal gain strategy to uh, ART. And in, in this section, what I aim to do is look at the, uh, we've talked about the lab, concentrating on the lab, but we'll look at the interface between the lab and um, the clinical procedure room um, and specifically look at marginal gains at the egg collection. And what I want to look at in a little bit more detail um, is uh, specifically the role of uh, follicle flushing and the media used and um, the control of temperature. Um, I think flushing generates many questions from labs about how to optimize uh, temperature control, types of needles, the length of the tubing, which media to use and so on. But I thought it would be helpful to start with a quick review of the value of flushing. And I've taken this systematic review uh, from Giorgio and uh, colleagues published in 2018 as a, a good starting point because they did this systematic review of the literature and looked uh, and reported essentially a few key points that we can uh, go through. And the first is that um, uh, the critical uh, feature of follicle flushing is that you don't get uh, more oocytes by doing it. So they showed really quite nicely that the, the overall comparison of the, the well controlled studies shows that flushing and not flushing yields the same number of oocytes. And that's a critical starting point for us. What they also showed um, from, from these um, studies is that uh, the pregnancy rates were the same in both, in both groups. So again, this suggests at least that there's no obvious detrimental effect um, to flushing or not flushing, but there certainly isn't an advantage of one uh, approach over the other. So uh, what, what does um, clearly shift when you introduce flushing to the egg collection is the duration of the procedure itself. So um, this shows really nicely that it favours aspiration only because the, um, the egg collection becomes somewhat shorter. Now that's, that's an important consideration because if the egg collection is longer, it potentially adds to the discomfort of the patients. Um, and as I've already illustrated, the number of eggs doesn't increase and the pregnancy rate doesn't uh, seem to be improved. So you're not, you're not making the uh, egg collection longer and potentially uh, more uncomfortable uh, for any, any obvious net gain. And if the egg collection is longer, then the workflow potentially also is less efficient. So that's an important factor to build in to the decision making when offering um, flushing or not flushing. But interestingly, let's, let's look specifically at poor responders. This is the group for whom flushing is usually advocated since there's a greater incentive to, to ensure every follicle is drained 
and every available oocyte recovered since there will be fewer available to begin with. And in fact, there's, there's very few um, good studies that address the merits or otherwise of flushing uh, in this specific group of patients. And this is one of the few from uh, Mocklin uh, and co-workers co from 2013, where they re actually reported poorer outcomes when flushing, uh, where the woman presents with a markedly um, uh, a poor response. And what they demonstrated um, was uh, lower rates of implantation, clinical pregnancy and live birth. Now, it should, should be noted that this, this was a randomized controlled trial, but it involved relatively low numbers of patients. And I think it's also worth noting that the, the fall off in results seems, seems quite extreme and certainly more than you might um, anticipate. That said, they showed that not flushing resulted in uh, more embryos and therefore more embryos that were available for transfer. And actually, if you look at the paper, the number of embryos transferred was higher in the, in the uh, aspiration group. So that might impact on the, uh, the higher pregnancy and live birth rates uh, seen simply because they had more embryos that were put back. But what we can't exclude is the possibility that in these poor responders, these poor responder cases, that flushing um, might be more intensive than in the normal responders where the, the results are comparable. And that additional flushing might impact on the oocyte and subsequent embryo quality, perhaps linked to control of conditions during the egg collection. Or it might indeed have an impact on the follicle and the formation of the corpus luteum. That, that's been mooted in. Uh, papers in the past. In contrast, um, this study looked specifically uh, at flushing for um, natural cycles and the monofollicular cases where you're aiming for only one uh, follicle. And Cole Schwartz and, and colleagues only last year suggested in these cases that flushing led to a better chance of retrieving the oocyte and that in turn made it more likely the transfer would be possible, although it should be noted that wasn't statistically uh, a, a significant increase. Um, but the, uh, the pregnancy rates and live birth rates were, were not improved. So flushing might help in limited cases, but the downsides are longer procedures and the need for additional control measures um, to maintain temperature. Uh, for example, uh, which may even disadvantage some patients and specifically these poor responders that are often targeted for flushing. Turning to the control of conditions, uh, should we wish to choose, uh, should we uh, wish to uh, flush? One additional consider consideration is the medium that we use. Um, and this is often a, a, a question that we, we get asked. Uh, and again, there isn't a massive amount of, of liter literature uh, that you can resort to, but um, I've picked out a few uh, key papers. Um, uh, in 1997, Bill Yan and, and colleagues reported that saline worked as well as culture medium, in this case, Earl's Balanced Salt Solution. And so, um, uh, Products like normal saline and Hartman solution that's readily available in, in most clinics and most hospitals became widely used. And that's often been linked to uh, the, the costs involved. Um, that was reported by Lopti Yonoff and uh, colleagues in 2017 who showed a massive 40-fold difference in the costs between using saline and culture medium. So it's not surprising that these products are, uh, are used. There's some limited information, for example, in a study here in, um, in MERS, that the uh, choice of medium does uh, affect outcomes. But if we, um, if we look at uh, the, the, the products themselves, 
And the 1997 uh, paper by Billion was the comparison between saline and EARLS, but is that still valid? We know much more about the exposure of oocytes to media of different composition, and EARLS is not as complex as the uh, options available today. In addition, it's worth considering the characteristics of these cheaper alternatives, normal saline and Hartman's. Saline, for example, is above the 300 uh, milliosmoles per litre, um, which is a generally accepted uh, threshold for uh, osmolarity that could be detrimental to oocytes and embryos. And uh, importantly, it's also acidic. Uh, Hartman's is a little better in that the osmolarity is similar to culture media, but the pH is still low uh, and lower than we would normally want to expose eggs and embryos to. So just be aware of that and consider it, particularly if exposure time uh, might be longer than ideal. Um, a primary consideration, I think, during egg collection is the control of temperature, since we know oocytes are susceptible to damage, uh, particularly if the temperature drops, but indeed also if the temperature is too high. And we often hear about labs pre-warming uh, needles and keeping tubing length. Uh, to a minimum, but these should perhaps not be our main concern. This short communication from a group in uh, New Zealand, Reading uh, and colleagues back in 2006, demonstrated that actually it's this final drop of culture medium from the tubing into the collection tube um, that causes the largest drop in temperature. So you can see on the bar chart here, they showed a small drop in temperature at these early stages at the needle tip, needle hub, and in the tubing. But the real drop is this transition down into the collection tube. Um, and um, that should perhaps be our main point of focus. And what's been demonstrated nicely is actually that can be mitigated simply by pre-filling the collection tubes with two to three mils of pre-warmed flushing medium. Of course, this once again raises the issue of costs if, we, if we're using culture medium in there. But as Steve highlighted, marginal gains require this small uh, attention to detail. And it's worth mentioning, of course, that in the case of UK cycling, um, those improvements were, were assisted by uh, many millions of pounds of uh, UK lottery funding. So that the principle there is that the marginal gains might might come at some uh, some cost. So just to summarize, I, I think to optimize the egg collection, um, we should be aware that flushing confers no clear benefit for the mass, vast majority of cases. And it certainly com complicates the control of conditions, particularly uh, temperature. Um, though flushing um, might be useful for poor responders, there's also some evidence it could be det detrimental um, and in the natural cycle cases where we're only aiming for one follicle, um, you have a potentially a higher chance of getting eggs more regularly, but there's no obvious improvement in the uh, pregnancy rates for those patients. Temperature control is paramount. We should also make this note that temperature also dictates control of pH because the two are uh, interrelated. Um, and the Reading paper shows clearly that the biggest fall in temperature during um, aspiration of follicles is when the fluid enters the collection tube. And that's alleviated by adding pre-warmed medium to each tube. And that, that applies, it should be said, that applies even when the collection tubes are in a warming uh, block. So we should optimize the conditions um, by using appropriate media and I've, as I've highlighted saline and Hartman's are, are cheap, um, but there's, there's things that flag up that they're really not optimal for uh, exposing oocytes and embryos to. So that's um, uh, the bibliography, the references that Steve and I have used through our presentations, and um, uh, we will open for a few questions, hopefully. Hi. Hi, Dave. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. We've, we've not had any questions come in today. I don't know if there's anything that either of you two have 
have missed out or would like to elaborate on or expand upon from today's talk? Or if anybody, oh, a question's just, I'm saying if anybody would like to add one in, a question's just sneaked in. Well, this is a good one. We'd love a poll on the number of clinics that flush versus not flushing. Um, don't know if we're sophisticated enough to just uh, set up a poll now, <laughs> but <laughs> but that's a really good point. I don't know if either of you would like to comment on that, if you have any feel for that or any idea. No, I think I, I I don't know is the quick answer, but um, I think flushing is becoming less and less common. Um, but I think there is this tendency to um, persevere for fl with flushing for the poor responders. I think most clinicians will resort to flushing um, for cases where the egg numbers are likely to be low, and. Um, in preparing this presentation, I think finding that Mocklin paper where they actually showed that it might be detrimental was really um, illuminating for me because I generally just accepted that flushing in those cases was, um, you know, just one of those things that made everyone feel more comfortable. Um, that paper, um, if if we could get similar data from, from other groups and with bigger numbers would be really interesting to see because I think that really brings into question whether we should even do it for those patients. I, I think <clears throat> I, I, I have great sympathy with, with clinical colleagues around flushing um, because, of course, there is the, there's that sort of feel-good reassurance that you, you're doing everything that you possibly can to get eggs out. Um, and I, I suppose it's going to remain, isn't it, for as long as flushing does remain, it, it, it will stay as a battle between embryologists and, uh, and clinicians. I think it's important to make our clinical colleagues aware of the data that are out there um, in, in the hope that perhaps they can be convinced by that. Um, and I think the idea of, of, a, of a survey to find out what people do, are doing would be really interesting. Um, perhaps there's some way that Cooper Surgical could set that up. Hmm. Or, or perhaps we could include that one in our next uh, webinar. Perhaps yeah. we could ask that question then. Um, Danielle, who's on technical support, tells me, unfortunately, we can't add it in now at this stage, but we could include that in our next one. So so we'll do that. Thank you for requesting that idea. If, if there's no more comments, and I'm conscious of time as well, because we've overrun a little bit today, I'll um, thank Dave and Steve for, for presenting for us today. Um, we've really enjoyed that. I think that's uh, set the scene nicely for the Marginal Gains webinar series and, and hopefully given our, our viewers a flavour of the kind of subject matter that we're going to be covering in this series.